All right, do you have your Bible? Matthew chapter 17, verse 14. Now, normally, I have my Bible, and I was going to have my Bible in my hands. It's actually on my seat because it's, it's the wrong version than what I'm reading. And so I thought, I can't, even, I can't even read it today. But normally, I do have my Bible. I'm a big fan of paper Bibles for devotionals, for our own walk with God, and, of course, in church. My favorite part is when we all get to hear the pages flipping. I love that. And clicking just isn't the same when we turn on our iPhone. But that being said, if all you got is your iPhone, use your iPhone. It'll also be on the screens. You can follow along that way. And hey, if you don't have a Bible but you want one, go to our Welcome Center right after service, and they will hook you up. So Matthew chapter 17, starting in verse 14, we'll read to 21. (coughs) This is what it says. And when they had come to the multitude, a man came to him, Jesus is him, kneeling down to him, saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless faithless and perverse generation, How long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon. And it came out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately, and they said, Why could we not cast it out? So Jesus said to them, Because of your unbelief. For assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith... As a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. However, however, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. I want to preach a message today called Bye Bye Boring Christianity. Bye-bye, can can I get a little wave? Bye-bye, boring Christianity. Let's pray. Jesus, right now, we make space in our lives. We cast aside distractions and worries and things that are clawing for our attention and our devotion. We say no to our flesh and we say yes to our spirit. We are here because we need an encounter with Jesus. So we pray that through your word, you would do what only you can do. We know that words of man fall short, but the word of God never returns void. So we make ourselves available and accessible for whatever you speak, whatever you say. We are obedient. We love you, and we thank you that you are here in this room working and ministering to us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, If you are uh, new here to Rose Church, again, welcome to you. Um, One of the biggest things about me, the most important thing about me, uh, while I'm a son of Jesus, and then I'm married to Roberta, and then I am a father uh, to two going on three amazing children. I often share stories about my kids, and I'm pretty sure one day we're just going to have to wipe everything off of YouTube because our kids will get older and say, Dad, I don't want my business on the Internet. So we'll do that one day, but until they have that moment, I'm just going to keep sharing stories. And uh, so usually the stories are about my daughter, Rome, because she's four, Rome Evie Rosalind. She's amazing. Uh, And I don't really get to share too much about Hanson because for the longest time, well, he was a newborn and then he's just a blob, just kind of just doing his thing, just just living his life. He just, we kind of just brought him places and like, what would I share? Oh, we brought him here. We brought him there. We brought him everywhere. Like a Dr. Seuss book. Um, But he's a little over a year and a half. And so just letting you know, the stories, they're going to start flying. He's at that phase now where he can walk, he is alert, and he is aware. He can see something, and he knows what he wants, but he's limited because he can point and moan and groan and say a few words and all of that stuff, and he can walk, but he can't fully communicate. He can't run. He's not really that coordinated. He's not really that effective. And so oftentimes, I see my son. This is, 
I'd say a good percentage of his life is spent in frustration because he sees something, he wants something, he wants to play that game with his sister, he wants to go down that slide with the bigger kids, he wants to do that activity, he wants to eat that thing, he wants, he wants, but he's not developed enough, he's not mature enough, he's not grown enough to be able to access it. And so most of the time he's frustrated and he does this thing where if he's frustrated, he just gives up on life. <laughs> he's like, I couldn't figure out with my little toolbox that I got for, for Christmas how to get the screw to, to drill into the screw. Like he's got his drill and his little setup thing and he can't get it in and if he does get it in he can't get it out and so he just flops on the ground and he's just like I'm done and no word of a lot he'll spend a minute two minutes just processing his frustration just completely frustrated that he can see and he can desire and he can know but he does not have the ability to carry it out I think you see where I'm going with this. Oftentimes as Christians, don't you feel the same way? Like you're in the word and you read it and you're like, that's amazing. Or you heard the sermon and you're like, yes, and you're amening and you're so amped up and you walk out and you're like, I'm a changed person. I'm never going to be that way again. And you see what's possible or God gives you a word or someone prophesied over you and you're like, yes, the future is so bright. It's so good. The best is yet to come. But then you aren't able to walk it out. Because you don't have the character or the maturity or the ability or it's just not the right time. And what does that result in? Frustration. And we start to think what? Christianity is ineffective. Jesus isn't really who he says he is. He can't really do what he said he can do. Maybe the Holy Spirit did stop moving in the apostolic age and the gifts of the Spirit and the Holy Spirit isn't moving like we think. And we come up with all of these reasons and we deem Christianity to be irrelevant. And Jesus is not relevant to my day-to-day -day life because I see it and I want it, I desire it, I long for it, but I cannot get there. I'm stuck and therefore I'm frustrated. And we deem Christianity to be boring. Lame. Man, I don't really see how this actually affects me. And maybe you still turn up because, man, you've been going to church for a long time. And then you're wondering why everyone is clapping and why is everyone so excited. And they just said they're doing a financial peace course. Why did everyone cheer and celebrate? And it's like we just lost the wonder. And the reason why everyone claps and cheers after every single announcement is because we are excited and honored that God would move in our community. So what God, what's happening in church life? We get pumped about. But we're frustrated. And the disciples in this story we read a moment ago in Matthew chapter 17 find themselves in this frustration. I saw it. I tried it. I attempted it. But I can't do it. And now I'm frustrated and I don't know how to move forward. See, there was a man who brought his son to the disciples and uh, he had some issues. He had some problems. There was some spiritual activity, some health issues that were initiated by that demonic spiritual activity. And so they bring, he brings his son to the followers of Jesus who, by the way, have been given power and authority to cast out demons and do ministry on behalf of Jesus for the kingdom. But they're unable to cast out this demon. They're unable to bring about healing for this little boy. And so the dad, any good dad would do this, bypasses the process, skips the line and goes right to Jesus and says, hey, I went to your disciples. I did what I was supposed to do. They weren't able to heal my son. Can you heal my son? Praise God, Jesus heals the son, the demon flees, the boy is cured at that very hour. We just read that in the text a moment ago. By the way, this is not a story. This is history. This actually happened. And then the, the disciples are perplexed. They're frustrated. They're standing and they're watching this happen. And they're like, we tried and we tried and we prayed and we did the thing and we did all the steps and we watched the seminar and the guy who told us he'd teach us how to do this. But they couldn't do it. They were frustrated. And then Jesus in this moment, it's so cool, I love this, Jesus likens the problems that we face in life to mountains. So your problems, Jesus says, 
our mountains. I was thinking about this this week. You know what's so cool? In the Bible, our problems are mountains. You know what our victories are also? Mountains. Because God will take the thing that is standing in your way and he will allow you to stand on it in due time, in his timing, in his way. And so do not be discouraged, do not be dismayed if there is a mountain standing in your way. I prophesy and I declare that you are going to stand on that mountain and testify to the Lord's goodness, testify to his power, testify to his mercy. So Jesus says problems are like mountains. And as a follower of Jesus, you have the ability with just a small amount of faith, faith the size of a mustard seed, just a little bit of faith. This speaks to not how great we are or anything like that, or any, it just speaks to the power of faith. All you need is a little bit, just a dash of salt, just a dash of faith, and you can cause those problems to move out of the way. I was thinking about this week, and Roberta and I were reminiscing, and we're about to approach our fourth year as a church, which is crazy. I was telling the team this morning, I feel like we're 40 and four days. <laughs> At the same time, it's like, where did time go? But also, I feel like I've aged significantly. No gray hair yet, except for one random hair in my beard sometimes. <laughs> random fact about me. <laughs> yeah, it's not there all the time, just I guess when I'm more stressed or something. <laughs> oh, man. But I was thinking about... <laughs> oh, man. We don't take ourselves too seriously here. Um, I was thinking about all the mountains that have been climbed all the battles that have been fought. And oftentimes, when we share about the story of Rose, we, we share about these amazing milestones. And I just need you to know that from milestone to milestone, that in between yeah. is a battle. Yeah. Every point of growth, every next step is a hard-fought season to get to where we are. I mean, I even think about just the time that we shared that we were going to begin the process of planting a church, starting a church. Um, it was early 2019, and we knew we were going to plant a church. I knew, and Pastor Roberta knew we were going to plant a church since like 2000 and, what, 2000 and 2013? Like a long time. God just gave it to us so clearly. And I was new to faith. I didn't even know what church planting was. Like, why do they call it planting? You don't plant a business, but I do understand why you plant churches. But I didn't understand any of it, but I was like, okay, we're going to do that one day. But we just waited for the right time, and then God just started stirring this holy discontentment, this, like, desire to go. But not to go immediately, not to go right now. We went to our lead pastors in uh, early 2019, and we said, hey, we want to plant a church, get this, in September of 2024. We did not want our launch Sunday to be until what is now going to be our fourth birthday. But we left that meeting, and God spoke to them, and God continued to just ruffle up our souls, just like stirring this unease. And all of a sudden, it was like decided, like, no, we need to go now. And that process, although so exciting, was excruciating. It was so difficult. It was a mountain in our life. We moved from Edmonton. We were babies. We had just gotten married, just graduated Bible college, joined this amazing church, fell in love with our leaders. Like, we served our leaders like nobody's business. And when we left this church, no one came with us from that church except for, like, three people. And the reason why is because we sowed and we tethered everyone. We tethered everyone to our leaders, not to us. So I would start our youth ministry every Friday, and I would say, hey, welcome, everyone. On behalf of our lead pastors, Pastor Todd and Pastor Carolyn, we want to welcome you to Riverwood Youth. 
It wasn't about me. It was about serving their vision. And so when we left, it was like losing mom and dad. We lost brothers and sisters, and there was this extremely painful process. It was a mountain that we had to go through, wondering like, like all of our best friends, and this whole thing is turned up, and, and what's going on, and who are our people going to be? But, but God gets you on the other side of the mountain. And it's crazy because now the people who we do life with, I'm talking about you. Um, we couldn't imagine our lives without you. So we couldn't imagine not being in this environment. And now all of a sudden we're here and we're like, oh, my gosh, you truly are the God who who levels the mountains. We just gone through some hard things. We hadn't even launched yet. And all of a sudden this other mountain pops up and we're all of a sudden blasted on social media being canceled because we have a traditional, historical, biblical view. And we're being blasted, and people are saying all this stuff, and like we thought we were goners. I was like, we haven't even had day one yet. We made it to minus 300 days. We were a year away when this happened. Like, oh my gosh, we are the worst church planners in the history. We got a negative church. How is this even possible? But we're just blasted. And I remember crying. I remember spending time on the floor. I remember just wanting to quit. We wanted to run back to Ed. Our biggest, like, in our head, we're like, what if we just moved to a small town and farmed in Mexico? (laughs) This is where we were. There was a mountain in front of us, and we could not fathom getting past it. And God, he just, he levels mountains. When we move forward in faith, he just moves them out of the way. And now I've been canceled. Well, there was that time, and there was another time, and there was another time. And now when it happens, I think, oh, I'm on to something. I'm on to something. It actually stirs my faith. And I'm like, oh, man, if a social media assault could not stop this church from forming, nothing can stop this church from forming and moving forward. And so we operate in faith, knowing that God is the God who moves mountains. He moves mountains. He's done it over and over again. This building, and man, I'm skipping so much stuff because some of the battles are just for me and my bride and Jesus. But there's so much stuff. But can I tell you one more? This building. This building. I don't know. I I just, I don't know. I don't get it. We're not even four. Okay, we don't have enough people to raise the amount of money we raised. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. But God made a way. Yeah. And can I tell you what this building was birthed out of? This building was birthed out of the worst season of my life. Yeah. I shared about it at our grand opening Sunday. Um, or, or I think it was our grand opening yeah. Sunday, yeah? Yeah. yeah? About how in early... Uh, 2023, like I was at an all-time low. I didn't want to live. Like I didn't want to die, but I didn't want to live. Some of you know what that's like. I was just like, I'm just, I'm just done. I was constantly in my head thinking about what else could I do with my life, and my wife was constantly telling me, you have no other skills, this is it. <laughs> How do you process that when you are at a mental all-time low? There's just no escape. There's no getting out of this. It's like you are just not good enough to do anything else. Like I walked into, this is the moment I, I realized that it was like, whoa, I'm a disaster right now. As I walked into my garage and I did some measurements and I realized that the, the beams in my garage were too low for me to hang from. And out loud, if you think this is a swear, I apologize. I said, damn it. And then, and then immediately it was like God just kind of rushed in and was, I was like, all of a sudden I'm brought back to reality and I'm like, what is going on? Yeah. This is, what, did, I, did that just happen? Right. This, I had no anxiety, no depression, Really, I, I've grown up a lot, but like not even aware of my emotions. 
prior to planting this church. And now I'm like, I got a family and kids and, and, and relatively a good life. And, and here I am with all this pressure and I just want to throw it, throw it away. So I ended up going to our board and our past, my, our overseers, our pastors, and just like, guys, I, I don't know what to do. So they, they sent me away. I said, you got to go get some rest and get some restoration. I did in one week the equivalent of a year and a half worth of counseling and therapy. And man, we just dove in and we went for it. And I came back refreshed and and I've never been back to that place again. And by God's grace, I never will. It was a mountain, but don't clap or anything. Um, because here's what's crazy. So at this place that I went to, to get better, because I was just, cortisol levels are all over, running on adrenaline, exhausted, just like, just where is Jesus in all of this? You're not allowed to have your phone. And, and it's not about any responsibility or anything. It's just about, it's just about you and, 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 and Jesus. And, and so all of a sudden, it's the last day, and I turn on my phone. And I call Roberta, and I hear her voice, and I just break, and she hears my voice, and she just breaks because she's, she's at home. And we had, by the way, we had a one-month-old at this time. Like, I was so broken that she's like, you got to go even though this is crazy for me right now. She's like, one month postpartum, we got a newborn at Rome. She's like, you got to go. And so I hear her voice, and we break down, and then she's like, hey, I'm... I'm such a um, boss babe CEO right now. I'm literally, I just stepped out of a Zoom meeting. We're having an emergency board meeting because we found a building. My flight was the next day. She's like, we're setting it up for you to see it the morning after you land. And we came into this space and it was cubicles and it was nothing like what it is now. And we put the offer in and we raised the money and here we are. There was a mountain and God moved it. He's faithful to move mountains. Okay, let me just mess with you a little bit, okay? Every time that I get to the other side of a mountain, I look back and all of a sudden, it's not a mountain, it's a hill. Because what God does as we fight the battles and we move forward in faith and as we trust him, as we walk in obedience, as we live lives of surrender, as it's about his will and it's not ours, as we climb those mountains, he actually grows who we are on the inside. And what looked so daunting and big and massive and there's no way I'm going to get through this, all of a sudden on the other side is this hill. And every battle that I've walked through, although some of them I wouldn't want to walk through again, I know that I could conquer them, that I could overcome because God grew me through it. Now here is what I feel like the Lord is stirring in our community. And it's even confirmation, just the way that we were worshiping. God is calling us to go deeper. And I just believe that everything that God has done in the life of our church, in my life, in your life, has been a hill. But there are mountains, real mountains coming. Jesus says problems are like mountains. And the disciples had this mountain, they had this problem, and they weren't able to solve it. So Jesus steps in and he solves it. And the disciples say, what do I need to do? What do we need to do to solve it? And Jesus says, there are some problems. There are some mountains. There are some issues in your life. Some circumstances, some next levels, some places you want to go but can't seem to get there. There are some things in your life that can only be made possible, that can only be conquered or overcome with two things, prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting. If you want to go to the next level in your walk with Jesus, we need these two things, prayer and fasting. Y'all are like, cool, prayer, let's do it. Let's do it. You're like, fasting, that ain't, we don't gotta though, right? We don't have to Fast? I've gone my whole Christian journey without fasting. I know, and that's why you're bored. 
So today, I want to invite us into, actually, sorry, Jesus is inviting us into another level, another realm, another stage. We're saying bye-bye to boring Christianity. So prayer and fasting, 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 fasting. Write that down if you're taking notes in big capital letters. Fasting, F-A-S-T-I-N-G, fasting. Let's talk about fasting because Jesus just gave us the cheat code. There's problems in my life, Jesus, that I cannot solve. Prayer and fasting. God, I can't get through this season. Prayer and fasting. God, I can't make it. Prayer and fasting. It's just the giant, the the Goliath, he's there. Prayer and fasting. But God, I've been battling. But have you fasted? Prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting. So we're launching into a season of prayer and fasting. I was talking to Pastor Jonathan. Were you here when Pastor Jonathan preached a few weeks ago? He's insane. He's an overseer. I love him. When I grow up, I want to be just like him. He's amazing. I asked him when he came. I said, all right. I was driving him back to the airport. I said, "Uh, uh, Pastor Jonathan, lay it on me, man. What do I need to do? What do I need to correct? What systems are broken? What's the cultural issue? What do I need to say to our team? What do I need to do? He said, hey, Uh, Does your church do a time or a season of corporate prayer and fasting? And I said, no. We did once. We just kind of, we just haven't done it. He said, do that. Talk to me in two or three years. And then we'll talk about if there's anything else we need to adjust. And I'm like, that's it. We often fight and we come up with plans and all these strategies. And it's just like, man, fight the spiritual battle. So we're going to fight the spiritual battle. So fasting, what is fasting? And hang with me, it's 11 o'clock. My time is up in two minutes, but it's only 11 o'clock, okay? So thank you for, shout out the worship team for going quick. Shout out our MCs for speeding it up so I have a little more time. Because I believe that this could, this could shake our church. This could change your life. This could change your marriage. This could change the trajectory of your legacy. I believe that this could change our city and beyond. So what is fasting? I'm not going to give you everything, but I'm going to give you a general understanding. What is fasting? Can we throw this quote by John Piper up on the screen? I got a few quotes. I'm going to let other people tell you what fasting is. John Piper, amazing pastor, says this. Fasting is a temporary renunciation of something that, in, that is in itself good, like food, in order to intensify our expression of need for something greater. So what he's saying is you go without food and all of a sudden you're feeling those hunger pangs, that desire, that longing for whatever you've eliminated, that is actually meant to draw you to what really matters, which is Jesus. He's the something greater. And this is what he says to conclude, namely God and his work in our lives. That is the something greater. The greatest thing in your life is God and his work in our lives. This is also what John Piper says. Throw this up on the screen, please. Christian fasting at its root is the hunger of a homesickness for God. Christian fasting is not only the spontaneous effect of superior satisfaction in God. Get this. It is also the chosen weapon against every force in the world that would take that satisfaction away. Come on. Are you excited to fast? We're going to be by the end of this sermon. Uh, and, then, and, then, and then Jensen Franklin, another pastor, listen to what he says. He has a whole book about fasting. You know, people have written whole books about this stuff, and we just, we just don't even do it. The Bible, by the way, talks about fasting in over 70 verses. When you eliminate food from your diet for a number of days, your spirit becomes uncluttered. And how many of us have cluttered souls? It becomes uncluttered by the things of this world and amazingly sensitive to the things of God. So hear me. Hear me. Here's why we don't want to fast. We don't want to fast because we don't want to go without food. Let me tell you, fasting is not about going without food. Fasting is about drawing near to God. And the Bible says that as we draw near to God, what does God do? He draws near to us. So there are four different types of fasts. And by the way, you can go to our website, rosechurch.ca slash prayer and fasting to learn more about fasting. We got a number of resources, books, articles, plans, strategies, what you need to do to prepare, a podcast, all different sorts of stuff on our website. Four different types of fast. Can we just leave these on the screen for a moment? There's the complete fast where you just decide, I'm going for a season with like only water, maybe some juices just to get you the base nutrients, but there's no food uh, at any time for a certain amount of time. Just complete 
fast. There is a selective fast, which is where you decide I'm going to fast, let's say, caffeine, or I'm going to fast sugar, or I'm going to fast this specific type of food. You are selecting certain types of food to go without. And it's not broccoli, okay? Because yeah, I love the Lord. I'm going without broccoli. Do you see? <laughs> it's like, it's not that. It's like, what do, you, what, do you, what do you crave? Like, for me, it's like chips at night. I just love chips at night, and it's just so bad. It's so bad. I'm trying to stop it. Pray for me. So you select the thing you're going to go without, and then it's partial. Partial. This is often in the Old Testament we would see partial fasts. Fasts. This is where uh, they would fasts. Um, I saw you roasting me. He leaned over. He's like, he's an idiot. It wasn't Matt this time. Yeah, but you definitely logged it. Yeah, he's like, ah. <laughs> See, no other skills. <laughs> it's called a callback. That is comedy at its finest. Okay, so then there's a partial fast, which is like sunrise to sunset. I'm not going to eat between sunrise and sunset, but anytime, you know, during that, that, that then, then we could eat. And then there's also a soul fast. Okay, so right now, PR, Pastor Roberta, I call her PR, she's not going to be fasting any type of food because her and baby need it. Okay, so that God would be like, no, stop, stay alive and keep that baby alive. But she can have a soul fast. So she can choose, I'm going to fast um, the, the dumb shows that I watch on TV. And there are plenty. There are plenty. <laughs> when it comes to reality TV shows, Roberta watches them all. We're just praying and believing for her. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, okay. So those are the four types of fasts. So uh, uh, you can learn more about those on our website. Now, next question. Can we throw this question up on uh, the screen? Do we have to fast? Okay. Pastor Mark, do we have to fast? No, you don't. Well, if I never fast in my whole life, will I go to heaven? Yeah, you will. Will Jesus love me if I never fast? Will he judge me at all? No, he'll love you, and he will not judge you in any way, shape, or form. But... Jesus talked about fasting, and he talked about fasting in such a way that it was assumed that his, that his followers would fast, that it would just become a part of their rhythm, their spiritual rhythm, their devotion to God. So you don't have to, but if you want to go to the next level, you must. You must. You just, there are things in our faith that God has given us to take us to the next level. And if we do not engage them, lean into them, uh, work these disciplines, go into the unknown, the uncomfortable, experience some discomfort in our lives, we will just not go to the next level. And so, no, you don't have to. You don't have to join with us as a community. You can say, no, I'm not going to do that. But if you do engage in it, you will grow. You will draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. He will take you to the next level. Here's what fasting does. Fasting is your way to say, bye-bye, boring Christianity. It's the way that you're going to move those impossible mountains in your life. So that addiction you have, that you still have, that you've asked for prayer over and over for, but you still have it, that breakthrough that you really, really need and you've been asking for, but it's not there, I just think maybe... If we were to engage in a fast, get clarity with us in God that those things would appear smaller than they actually are. There's other things that we got to do on top of that, but it gives us the leg up. It gives us that first step towards victory that we otherwise would not have. Yeah, but what if I just pray more? It's Jesus said prayer and fasting. Yeah. And do you know there are some translations that in this text do not include the word fasting? So we read this and we just read prayer. And prayer is amazing. we got to pray. We're not going to not pray during this season. But fasting, I just think it's something that the enemy has so strategically removed from our churches to our detriment and to the detriment of the world. Why should we fast? Can I just give you a bunch of quick scriptures really quickly and reasons why we should fast? Okay? Let's go through these. Here's why we should fast. Let's throw this up there. Fasting unlocks, can we throw it up there? Fasting unlocks revelation. 
If you want revelation in your life, if you're like, God, I just want you to speak to me. I just want you to show things to me. I want you to, you, you, you to illuminate your word to me and, and just speak to me in new and fresh ways. Look at what happened to Moses. This is crazy. Exodus, can we throw that up there? Just flow with me, team. Just flow with me. Uh, Moses was there. This is Exodus chapter 34, verse 28. Moses was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights without eating bread or water. What was he doing? He was fasting. Look what happens. And he wrote on the tablets the word of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments were birthed out of a season of fasting and prayer. Come on, that's revelation. Next, fasting unlocks direction. Look at the book of Acts. Can we throw this scripture up here? Acts chapter 13, verse 2. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. They were praying about direction, fasting for direction. And in that season of fasting, God gave them the the direction. Paul and Barnabas were going to send them out. If you're looking for direction, fasting. Next one. Fasting unlocks heavenly rewards. Man, I want some blessings. I want some heavenly rewards. Listen to Jesus. And when you do fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your heavenly Father who sees in secret will what? Reward you. When we fast, when we say, God, I'm stepping out, I'm I'm pursuing you in a new way, in an uncomfortable way. He rewards that because it's courageous. It's bold. It's it's, it's devotion. And God loves that and he rewards that. Get this one. You're going to love this one. Fasting unlocks victory. Fasting unlocks victory. Uh, Israel, uh, God's people, the Israelites are about to face this battle. Look what they do. Then all the Israelites, the whole army, went up to Bethel, and there they sat weeping before the Lord. And what did they do? They fasted that day until evening and presented burnt offerings and fellowship offerings to the Lord. And then they went and won that battle. It is the prerequisite to some of the battles. It is the prerequisite. It, it is required Like Jesus said to the disciples, some of these can only be done by prayer and fasting. Some victories will only ever be accomplished with prayer and fasting. Fasting unlocks favor. I love this moment, the book of Esther. Go gather, this is what she says, go gather all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will also fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So she wants to go to the king on behalf of her people because her people are in bondage. They are held captive. There is about to be a genocide against her people by this nation. And so Esther has been raised up. And in order to earn the favor of the king so that she may not be put to death, but would in fact Free her people, says, fast for me that God might move and I might receive favor. Fasting unlocks repentance. Jonah, chapter 3, verse 5 to 9. The Ninevites believed God. And a a fast was proclaimed. And all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah... Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh. He rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, offered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. By this, pro- this is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent with compassion, turn his fierce anger so that we will not perish. Their fasting was their act of repentance. It unlocks repentance. I'm not talking about remorse. I feel bad because I got caught. I'm talking about repentance. This isn't God's best for me. So I'm turning from my will and I'm turning to his. And sometimes we think we can just repent. No, sometimes you cannot physically do that turn. So you need assistance and that assistance is fasting, it unclutters your soul, and now you can turn and you can start moving towards Jesus. Fasting unlocks humility. Look at Psalm 35, 13. But, when, when I, but I, when they were sick, I wore sackcloth. I afflicted myself with fasting. I prayed with my head bowed on my chest. We see this act of deep, deep humility. I can't do it on my own, and so I'm fasting as a sign that I am desperate for God. 
Fasting unlocks strength. There's nine total. I don't know what number we're on, and then we're about to wrap. So worship team, why don't you come up? Because we're going to seal this time together. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. It gave him strength. Do you need strength? Do you need victory? Do you need direction? Do you need favor? Do you need repentance? What do you need in your life that you have been struggling with? You see it. You know it's possible but you just can't get there, but you can with fasting. One final one, fasting unlocks purpose. Acts chapter 13, verse 3. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. Fasting unlocks purpose. There's so much more that God has for us. A lot of us would say, I have a good life. God wants you to have a great life. Anyone can have a good life. Christians are blessed by God to live great lives. But a great life takes some effort. It takes some spiritual discipline. It takes leaning in when it's uncomfortable. Fasting is what we're going to be leaning into. Because I sense God calling us deeper. I sense God wanting to give us more. I sense God wanting us to make... If I, if I were to share with you the vision I have for what our community could do, I think you might laugh and leave. So we're not even prepared to receive the vision. we got to get our souls stronger. I don't really care about having a big church. I care about having a church that's big on the inside. And fasting is what God is going to use to enlarge our life, grow our character, mature us, bring us further into his plans and his purposes for us. So the invitation of Jesus is this, that we would enter into a season of 14 days of prayer and fasting starting tomorrow. That we would spend the rest of today figuring out what that would look like. And if you need a little more time, that's fine. Start on Tuesday. But if you feel God stirring in you, if you got some things that you're just like, man, I just just want more of Jesus. I just, I want to be stronger. I sense him calling me to more. Then this is your invitation, not by me, because I'm nervous. Like, I don't want to go without, but I want more of God. So we're entering into a corporate season of prayer and fasting for 14 days. And then in January, we're going to do it again for 21 days. And then in August, we're going to do it again for 21 days. And then in January, we're going to do it again for 21 days. And every January and every August, starting now, we are going to corporately pray and fast to call heaven down to this earth in our lives and in the lives of those around us. So 14 days of prayer and fasting. That's what we need to be in prayer about the next few hours. I know it's not a lot of time. I know it's not a lot of notice, but don't let that be an excuse. We probably already know what we can, should give up. We probably got some battles and some mountains, some things that we know we need God's help with. So let's be a people who run after God. Let's be people who are devoted. Like let's, I'm, guys, I'm so done with boring Christianity. I'm so done playing church. I don't want to play church. I don't want you to play church. I don't want us to go through the motions anymore. This is stupid if we're just going, why are we giving so much money, time, and effort if this is just a thing that we do, some club that we're a part of? No, this is real life, soul change, change the world around us. Let's go to the next level. Let's make an impact. Let's do something inside that just can't be contained and it just comes out. Come on, let's, let's just drop that act, the drama of church. This, this is just so stupid. It's silly. It's silly. I don't use the word silly. It's not in my vocabulary, but it's silly. It's silly. It's done, and we're done with it. We're going to the next level. You don't have to, by the way. No one will judge you. Don't judge anyone if you find out they're not. But everyone who does, man, we're going to the next level. We're going to the next level. So you can go to rosechurch.ca. Let's throw this link on the screen. rosechurch.ca slash prayer and fasting to learn more. What an incredible opportunity 
to just draw near to God. And I know he's gonna draw near to us. Let's stand to our feet. I wanna pray for you and then we're gonna seal this moment in worship. Would you just stretch your hands to heaven as though you're reaching up to your heavenly father? Jesus, in this moment, our hearts cry. The desire of all desires is for you. We just want you. Thank you for giving us this cheat code. Thank you for giving us this direction. Thank you for sharing with us your heart for your people and how it looks to lean in and press in and long for more of who, we, who you are. Jesus, I pray that in this next season, these next two weeks, the next 14 days, that you would meet us in a way that we did not think was possible. That there would be testimony after testimony after testimony. I didn't want to do it. I thought it was stupid. I thought it was played out. I didn't seem like it was going to make a difference, but he changed me. God, in this season, I pray for one of two things. That our circumstances would change or that we would change. Meet us in our devotion. Meet us in this act of worship. And I pray that you would give everyone strength to do so to be courageous, to be bold, to step out into the unknown. And God, as we feel those hunger pangs, as we feel the, 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 the social media calling us or that show calling us or that thing calling us, would we use that as a reminder? No, I'm not going to that. I'm going to Jesus. And will we draw near like we've never drawn near before? God, I pray for every single person under the sound of my voice that you would take us to the next level. We're so done with the surface. We're done with milk. We want the next thing. We want real food. We want real revelation. We want God. We want all of you. We're so desperate for you. We want to walk in anointing. We want to walk in favor. We want to walk in victory. Thank you that you've shown us that fasting is the way to unlock all that you have for us. So Jesus, we love you. We thank you that you're good. We thank you for this invitation. And God, I thank you for the testimonies and the praise reports that are, that are going to come on the other side of this. I pray this in Jesus' name.